So we're uh, talking today about the um, outboard industry and what I call towards miniaturization. What do you mean by miniaturization? Making it smaller, yeah. more compact, portable. more horsepower, more portable? Initially, I think it was just coming up with the concept of a portable engine. Okay. You can store off the boat and bring to a boat and fasten onto a boat and enjoy. Okay. Uh, you know, traditionally, that uh, engines and boats were uh, combined. Yeah. So, you know, we'll talk about this. You're talking about going from this inboard style right. boat. This is a very small one, obviously, yeah. but. It's all fixed, and you've got a, right. you've, you've got, you don't have much portability here. No. So, but this was this was boating, in you know around 1900, I think the late 1890s. Um, this design was prevalent, and it lasted for you know many many years uh, until um, outboards became. Uh, a little more standard and and a little more available, and um, so so this is so miniaturization standard. would be talking about a uh, the size of the flywheel would be the first thing that struck me. These have got huge flywheels, right. and they're they're large and they require a lot of exhausting and yeah and uh, they're not portable. Big component, definitely not portable. With no thought okay. of making okay. anything portable at all. Okay, like so. Then, um, to, to get from that to a, a, a portable engine, there was, you know, early, early on there were different techniques used, but this would be like a typical, you know, piston and connecting rod from a single cylinder inboard type engine, which is quite, quite you're, heavy. You're having difficulty just handling the piston yeah, and connecting rod. If it falls off, it's going to break the floor. <laughs> uh, so, here we are with... Um, people, the need was there for a portable engine. Okay. And, and uh, Cameron Waterman recognized that, you know, fairly early on that he liked, he liked fishing, he liked boating, he maybe didn't like rowing so much, and he thought that it would be, he had it in his mind that he said it would be really nice if somebody would come along with a portable engine to, you know, okay. to on a boat. So he kept thinking about that, and. He had a great idea that um, he had a motorcycle. I forgot the, the make, but it was a single cylinder motorcycle um, that needed some overhaul. And this is a story. It was that a Curtis a Curtis motorcycle. A Curtis a, or a Yale or some the, yeah was, some single cylinder. Something to do with Curtis Wright, the airplane manufacturer. Well, he, I don't know if yeah. that was then or later, but yeah. But, so anyway, he. I guess one winter. Um, when he was at uh, at Yale, he um, he decided to take his motorcycle apart and bring the engine inside, and he did do that. And it was a single cylinder engine, maybe not too much different than this. It was a four stroke. The, the motorcycle industry really was the, were stuck on four stroke engines for some reason. And he brings this thing in and brings it into his uh, dorm room. So the story is and said, wow, this thing is really portable. Maybe this is the basis for a portable engine that can be used on a boat, a detachable engine. And so he really came up with this design, um, which is quite breakthrough at its time. He, you can really see the motorcycle style in the crankcase. Um, the flywheels are part of the crankshaft and are enclosed in this in this case, and that's that was typical with motorcycles from it's like almost day one. So we're looking at the flywheel and the and the crankshaft in, in this case inside, right here. Right, right. Unlike this over here, where we have the flywheel exposed. external. Right, right. Okay. All right. So, so there's there's lots of pictures around of the Waterman's experimental to get to. To this, he experimented okay. with different techniques, and he very rapidly abandoned the four-stroke idea. And uh, it's only a guess that maybe it was that he thought that the t that a, a boat engine needed, single-cylinder engine needed a firing impulse every turn of the crank. 
whereas a yeah. four stroke has that wasted um, two, you know, one rotation of the crank. And maybe the thought was that the flywheel would have needed to be too big to carry the momentum in between those firing strokes. So anyway, he went to a two stroke. There's pictures of maybe a prototype four stroke. There's a picture of a more of a little marine engine on a, on a frame like this with an exposed flywheel. Another picture that shows a chain drive. So he, he went through some stages of uh, experiment and, uh, and he really came up with this design. And um, it was a very successful design and he sold many, many. Um, and truly for the day, it was really miniature for, yeah. for engine yeah. design. It's really yeah. a miniature, miniature engine. And there's some other features that make this really kind of revolutionary is that uh, he decided, well, first of all, the, the technique of um, being able to steer the propeller was, was a great uh, breakthrough in, in control. And it was abandoned for some reason later on, but this was a very early feature. And the other early feature that is, is not recognized is the fact that there's actually a gear reduction driving the propeller, okay. whereas the, kind of the, the thought was that a propeller should run um, at engine speed like the predecessor inboards. Oh, so okay, so the next um, example towards miniaturization is Ole Evernoot's efforts. And this, this example is a fairly early one. Um, the serial numbers, uh, I think, dates it around 1911. One could argue maybe it's a late uh, 1910, which is um, you know about as early as you're gonna find. It's, uh, I think, you know, the Evernoot Company talks about 1909 being the first year. That's what but, the but, patent was passed. Yeah, it was, I'm, I'm sure that Ole had some prototypes running and maybe sold a few in 1909, but the real production year was, was uh, 1910. And, um, and this is either the late 10 or 11. Uh, so the, but the design is uh, Ole, back to this miniaturization, Ole kind of simplified the problem. I think the Waterman went uh, maybe to extremes. He, he, he really got a head start from the motorcycle industry and had this great motorcycle power head that he thought would be perfect and, and, it, and, it, and it worked out as we just talked about before that you know he designed around a frame for it and was able to put it on a boat but it wasn't really user friendly as far as um, well for one thing it didn't fit on any boat a flat bottom skiff this goes on yeah the waterman porto only fits on an hourglass stem yeah. type it or a wine glass stem yeah, it doesn't have a good transom bracket, really. Right. It's a, it's a right. kind of a special. So Ole thought about, I think, thought about the usability side of it. His innovation in the engine itself is can only be called innovative in that he just took existing technology and shrunk it. Yep. And and he was able to do that um, because he was a really good pattern maker. He understand understood foundry practices and thought that the, the, the foundries were able to make something smaller, smaller than they, they were used to making. Castings that were smaller, the cylinder being a complex casting because it's got water passages um, for cooling, it's got ports, it's got uh, somewhat complex casting. And Ole was able to perfect that. And the other thing that he perfected uh, was the mounting on the boat, which made it very easy, simple for people to use. and no starting crank, so the the, um, the starting was all done just with the flywheel, and um, no no separate crank. And of course, these early engines, like the Waterman, were were battery ignition, and uh, you had to carry a, a, a battery box that had a coil in it and a battery and plug. It, it, it's set up to plug in. So so these engines got very popular very fast because they were so easy to use and they worked good. They they started easy. And, um, and they fit any boat. Uh, so let's... Um, Started relatively easy. Yeah. It was any, <laughs> any, any, I mean, yeah, any two-stroke. So, but some of the internals, 
this this would be a typical internal crankshaft connecting rod for that that level of technology very simple drop forge steel crankshaft with a bronze connecting rod not counterweighted in, in any way um, cylinder again was like the earlier one this is a later cylinder that's damaged but you can see that uh, it's quite the casting yeah then they had cast iron pistons breakthrough uh, towards miniaturization is the Johnson effort and here we are now late teens Evernood has had great success um, with their single cylinder robot motor doing very very well um, other makers moved into that market in the teens and this Wisconsin over here is a is another example of copying that that technology. Um, very simple engines. There were many, many makers of these uh, single cylinder rowboat motors. Uh, Wisconsin, pre war, you know, pre war, pretty pre much. World War One. Yeah. yeah. So Kale was another big, big one. Um, yeah, there were, there were many, many, many. I can't. Joy Motor. Yeah, Joy Motor, Lockwood Ash, Pharaoh. Yeah. Um, Okay. Yeah. So there's a lot of them, and they all were basically the same. So the Johnsons uh, also, like Waterman, had a head start yes. in the outboard industry. Their head start was they had already developed the um, Johnson, what was called the Johnson motor wheel, and it was a small opposed twin engine, not too different than their than the outboard that ended up on a bicycle, and they made many many. In the late teens, of that of that design, and they used uh, the quick action magneto that was um, already in place on some of the rowboat motors. Called the Knobloch Heidemann Company, Warren Ripple buys the company, calls it the quick action magneto. Now is supplying magnetos to the Johnson motor wheel engine, and. Um, was Knobloch and Heidemann, were those the guys who actually designed that yeah, Magneto? Yes. Yeah, they did. And, uh, so did they stay on after it was bought out by Warren Ripple? I have no idea. No idea. No okay. Idea. But it was a great Magneto, and, um, and the Johnsons used it. And I think that was the beginning of the Johnsons and Warren Ripple business relationship. At some point, the motor wheel business dropped off. and uh, late It teens, said Model T. And the Model, the Model T, T hit got the blamed, kind of blamed for it because the Model T was so inexpensive to buy as a whole car. It it kind of took away that market of low cost transportation that some of the motorcycle um, companies were were using. That uh, okay. So so okay. So you know Johnson already had lots of experience with high speed engines, um, with their aircraft engines. They understood what it takes to make a high-speed engine and very successful motor wheel engine and I think they were at some point to say well what do we do now okay I think we we can use our what we've learned about portable engines to build a really fine upward motor so um, in um, 1921 they started production of the famous Johnson light twin and and that's um, Breakthrough in size, a truly miniaturization of um, of these engines, and this this is a later one. This is not a 22. This is probably a 27. 20, yeah. But but and it has a slightly bigger lower unit. But basically, the power head is similar, quite similar to the first. Um, same horsepower, same. Yeah, it might be a half horse more or something yeah. like that. 
So again, it's miniature engine, gear reduction lower unit to allow the um, engine to speed up a little bit and um, the, the lower unit looked very much like that right, right there didn't right, it? Yes. right. Um, and then um, so the gear reduction lower unit would have been in there would have been pretty much that lower unit pretty right much there that lower unit, yep. okay sure. yep. with a water pump on it yep yeah yep. okay. the insides of that light twin are here and and look how, I mean, look how tiny everything is compared to what the, you know, the Evernude was still making at the same time. Okay. And, um, and, and, you know, nothing special, cast iron pistons, bronze rods, but very lightweight and, and very miniature. Um, the Johnson's breakthrough, what they learned from the aircraft business was to get over a certain RPM, you needed a, a, a crankshaft with a hard surface case hardened crankshaft. And the okay. Johnson people pioneered that. What had plagued the whole engine industry was the fact that they were stuck with Babbitt bearings. And Babbitt is just a very soft metal, um, high tin content, which is a very soft, you could actually hand carve it, it's nice and soft. And the reason why they needed a soft bearing was because they had soft crankshafts. Anything harder than Babbitt would, would, would ruin a, um, a, a, a steel crankshaft that was unhardened. The reason why crankshafts need to be unhardened is, is that a, a dead soft crankshaft has much more fatigue resistance than a hardened alloy steel. And it was found that uh, the only way to um, really keep these old engines together was with a dead soft crankshaft and a Babbitt bearing, which severely limits the RPM that the engine can run at. Johnson people recognize that and determine that, well, if we, if we can do a, a case-hardened shaft, then we can do bronze rods. So this one right here is case-hardened. Yes, it is. This one is, is dead, soft. Dead soft. Dead, right. dead soft, yeah. is that the correct term for I that? I guess, yeah, you can All right, that. whatever, okay. And, and uh, so anyway, that allowed them to use bronze rods on a hardened bearing surface. Okay, but how did they overcome the fact that a hardened crankshaft was um, uh, incapable of fatigue? Giving fatigue. Yeah, yeah. you said this one would resist yeah. fatigue. So it's only case hardened. Ah. So it's soft inside. So it has the the qualities needed to be a good crankshaft, and it's uh, just hardened on the surface where the bearings bearings ride. Thank you. Yeah.